the conversation we'll be having right now is about birds. And the title of this conversation is Paying Attention. Uh, I'll just introduce our brilliant panel here. These are very uh, interesting people from all birders, but from three different perspectives. Uh, so the conversation we'll be having will be focused around how, uh, just about birds, but in details in th uh, three different ways. Uh, I'll introduce the panel. Also, oh, before that, I'm Prasit Stapit. I'm a photographer. I am a noob birder. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm here to learn, too. Uh, next to me is Isha Munshi. She is an architect, uh, a birder, a, sorry, an architect, a bird watcher, and citizen scientist. And she's the founder of Feather Library. Aaron von Riesen, I think I pronounced your name right. Yeah. Aaron von Riesen uh, is a rural development specialist who came first to Nepal in 1982 and is an avid birder uh, and also he helps out with Chimikitsara campaign. And Ankit Bilas Joshi is a wildlife conservationist and is currently the vulture conservation manager at Bird Conservation Nepal. So before we move ahead with the conversation, uh, we'll, have, we'll have them introduce themselves uh, very shortly, and then we'll begin the conversation. So first, I'd ask yeah. Isha to start. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm from India. And uh, by qualification, I'm an architect, no longer an architect. Now, uh, I left it for the, for the library. and. Uh, I've been uh, watching birds for over a decade now, and uh, I think the best I would like to describe myself is that I breathe birds. So 24-7, I breathe birds, and uh, that's about it. So whatever I do, whatever I, uh, whenever I think, it's always at the back of my mind, it's always uh, to do something with birds everywhere, all around, and... Um, so I founded this uh, Feather Library as a, it's a unique idea for the world in a way because uh, no one looks at the feather as, so birds are the only animals which has feathers, so it makes it unique, the project itself, which is only specific to birds. And I founded this Feather Library um, in 2021 after the lockdown. And uh, what I basically do is I tie up with the rescue centers and um, whichever birds are declared dead by the wet, I document them, I take the feather measurements. I So that data which is nowhere there in the world, I'm creating a database for the future generation. So, yeah, so that's about it, and uh, I'll talk about it later in detail, how I do it and why I do it. Thank you. The, sorry, I forgot to mention, the exhibition of Feather Library and Chimiki Tsara is in Chiasal, so do go check it out if you haven't. Uh, I'll move on to Arendai. Sorry. Uh, and I sorry, can you take the mic? Oh, yeah. It's a little bit uh, off. Oh, is this on? Does it matter? Uh, sorry. So, uh, yes, my, na my name is Arend Frisa. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, and I heard that there was a possibility to uh, give a small presentation uh, yesterday, but this morning I had another meeting about eBird. And uh, so I had one and a half hour to put something together, I thought it's better, because if people don't understand or don't remember, I, I hope everybody will remember whatever I put on the screen, so take out your notebooks. Um, and now, um, so 
I came here as a land and water management specialist, and, uh, and, uh, but I've always been involved also in agriculture and social development. And I've worked in the, uh, started in the far west and then moved to Kathmandu and from the Kathmandu again to the far east. Uh, that is all there somewhere written. Uh, in 82, uh, okay, uh, so, and, and after three years I met my wife and uh, that's why I'm still there. It's not because of the birds, because birds are not enough reason for the government of Nepal to allow you to stay. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, um, <coughs> so I, I, I've been very privileged, uh, as I, I put that up there, yeah. I'm very privileged and lucky guy. I've always, in, the, in the, 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 the dies of life, I've always thrown sixes somehow. I feel like that. Uh, one of them uh, brought also a lot of hardship uh, while working in the Far West. There was, uh, I will show that later, but uh, there was not much. Uh, but we still thought it was fantastic to stay there. The, the, the privilege to walk from village to village, always staying with villagers. If there are development workers now, they have to stay in a hotel like, like, like me, uh, what I'm now also doing, and then go to the village for half an hour, talk with people, come back. While I was allowed to stay with the people in the village, sit around the fireplace, eat there together, uh, whatever they have, and, and try to talk in my broken Nepali. At that time, it was more broken than now. So uh, that was a real privilege uh, to see those things. And as a birder, I've never been a birder uh, who chases species. Yeah, my, my species list should have been much longer. Uh, I'm not going to all those places. I, the last time I was in Chitwan was 16 years ago or so. And I've gone only twice there really for the birds, mostly for a holiday with family or whatever. Uh, but I've been lucky also for work to live if you're from Nepal, you know Doti and Bajang, well, in between is Kaptart. So if I had to travel from projects in Kaptart, uh, in Bajang, and go back to Doti where I lived, I would uh, go over, over Kaptart in the, in the summer. So there's always some opportunities I, I took in between. I, I planned travel in the, in, in, in the weekend or whatever, or during holidays. So this is... Uh, uh, I, I, I always tell birders, I'm born in the far west, uh, whether that's the Netherlands or Sudrpashim of Nepal. And uh, these are some photos uh, just of, uh, of, of, of DPL. There was no toilet, bathroom, vegetables, road, electricity. That was uh, only one year after uh, we came. It started that a uh, little bit. Not the, yeah, also even the toilet they made uh, in my last year there. Uh, and these are just some, some, some photos. Deurakel, everybody who's gone to the far west cannot escape that. You, you dance there. It's a dance that even I can manage. Uh, uh, there's the, the tea shop owner uh, from across our house where the Dalit had to put their own cup in the, f in the, in the top of the, uh, how do you say it, in the rafters and had to wash themselves and the money was thrown, all those things. I was aware through, uh, through my study uh, and through my stay in India, I did my first... Uh, one reason why I came to Nepal was that I wanted actually to go to India uh, because there I did my internship in a commune in Ashram, uh, which was... Uh, well, that's a too long story, but there also the Dalit problem was uh, very prominent. It was a Gandhian-style ashram. So I met some nice people, and to make the link with Asia, I met, of course, in Kaptart also, the Kaptart Baba had very interesting, very impressive men. These are three impressive men. Manjul, he was a poet, writer, song singer. Uh, he was my language trainer, so I was very lucky there. Then at Kaptart, I had some very interesting discussion with the Kaptart Baba. This is Bozraz Pokrel. You might know him as a ch secretary, chief secretary, chief of the election commission, the first one after this. He was my boss in Dandoldura when I worked there one year. We worked very close. We stayed in one house. We played Pablo every evening. So uh, he was an amazing, he's my best boss ever. Yeah, so uh, whatever you think about it, but uh, I think uh, quite, uh, quite right. The link between the Kaptart Baba and Esha is that when he was there and he knew uh, I talked about birds, uh, he said, yeah, the Flemings who did the first book, The Birds of Nepal, they were here and they shot birds with buckshot because they wanted to, uh, how do you say that, to stuff the birds and to make them possible to, to have that 
their, their book is full of pictures that are actually using those stuffed birds. Otherwise, I would not have learned birding. But he said to, the, he, he said to me, I asked the Flemings, if you love birds, why do you shoot them? Yeah, so, and that is, uh, I, I, I had no answer to that. And uh, I, I must admit that I would know less birds if they had not shot them. But I agree with the Captain Barba and with the Flemings both. So uh, that is anyhow uh, uh, something, I'm talking too long. So only I got birder friends in Nepal. I've been out eight years in between. Uh, around 2004 when I met uh, Bimal, Tapa and Lalit sitting and uh, Tauda. And after that, I became friends with a wider circle of friends of Bird. And uh, one of the things was within BCN, they had stopped Saturday birding. And we said, BCN is a membership organization. We should do that Saturday birding again. So we started that again slowly. And we're still doing with Friends of Bird every two weeks. And the other time, BCN is doing that. Uh, I started birding near where my new house was built our new house, my wife's new house, let's say, because she is uh, in Nepal, foreigners are not allowed to own anything. Uh, and that somehow got completely out of hand. And I, I, uh, I, I, I went 10 years along the exactly the same route. And I had a document, I wanted to share it online. And Carol Inskip said, you have to also print it. So I made it into a book, uh, but it went again also too far uh, that uh, I have now a lot of books and uh, after this uh, you can buy it, but the money will go to the uh, bird friendly neighborhood for which Saturday there was also a fundraiser. So that is uh, uh, roughly, I, I will not uh, go too far. Then the Chimiki Tsara campaign uh, was also because of Bimal Tapa made a book, uh, Garden Birds of, uh, of, of Nepal, just 50 common birds. I, I like that very much. And I combined it with the idea of the bird, the, the, the garden bird counts that are held in the, in the UK, in the Netherlands. And I thought that is the way how to make people watch and notice birds. And uh, we had an attempt earlier when there were no apps yet. Uh, we did it via email and, uh, and, and Excel sheets and everything. Uh, it didn't go far. Uh, and so when the app, when my son came and he is an app developer, uh, I thought, oh, maybe we can do that. He did a few things. Uh, he learned it himself. Uh, so we made an, an app and we can talk about that later, why we made this app and why not, for example, the eBird or the Merlin app. Uh, you can ask that uh, later. <laughs> yeah, sorry that I took so long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. You, your stories are always very interesting. Uh, Ankit, before I'll, I'll change the slides. Thank you, Prasid. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Ankit uh, Bilas Joshi, and I'm born in Kathmandu, in the core city of uh, called Nordebi. Uh, and and seeing around my place, I see only a few birds when I was in child. But uh, after growing, uh, growing up, I joined uh, my uh, education in environmental science. And after uh, joining my uh, education in environmental science, we, asked, we had to go to the field uh, in different places of Nepal and different uh, uh, national parks and wildlife reserve. And from that interest, I got uh, the interest in birds, but basically I was interested in big mammals. I did my master's in natural resource management and I did my master's in wild elephant. But after joining Bird Conservation Nepal uh, in vulture conservation uh, program, uh, I was involved in vulture only, uh, but after uh, involving in many bird watching trips and also the seniors uh, from our uh, office uh, involved me in the uh, bird watching trips, uh, so I got much more embarrassed that I do not know about birds <laughs> after uh, working in bird conservation in Nepal. So I did my uh, uh, passion and hobby in bird watching uh, along with the, uh, going through this uh, my job. So every six days I work as a as a desk, desktop or on a field. But on Saturday I join with all all the uh, bird watching groups for the bird watching. Thank you. Uh, I should continue the presentation. I, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I want to tell something about the bird conservation in Nepal. 
Uh, it was established in 18, 1982. Uh, it's a long term, like we, we had been uh, 40 years in the bird conservation in Nepal. And, but, but it was first, it was bird watching club. Uh, but later it uh, got into the NGO uh, called Bird Conservation Nepal. Uh, it is a leading organization uh, uh, of Nepal for focusing mainly on conservation of birds, uh, habitats, and its sites. And we are one of the leading organization which provides the scientific uh, data and the research uh, to the government of Nepal. And we are member-based member -based organization uh, where we have the founder uh, uh, presidents, advisors, and the patrons. Uh, we have also the general members, student members, and all the supporters uh, who can join us as a member. Uh, so there, there is a website, uh, www.birdlifenepal.org. So I request everyone who loves bird can join as a member uh, of our organization. We are also the partner of BirdLife International. Uh, it is a worldwide global network of uh, uh, birding communities or birding organization. We have uh, 121 organizations. From each country, there is only one uh, partner from BirdLife International, and from Nepal, it's the Bird Conservation Nepal. Uh, as I have already said, we work with the government of Nepal, and we have uh, uh, developed the uh, Develop the action plans, the specific species action plans like Bengal Florican action plan, vulture action plan, and all the action plans that the government have implemented, we, we implement along with the government of Nepal. And similarly, we have identified the important birds and biodiversity areas. Uh, these are, we have identified now 37 IVAs. Uh, uh, that is very important for the birds and biodiversity. Uh, Next, uh, yeah, this is the recently published Birds of Nepal official checklist by Department of National Parks and Wildlife Conservation with collaboration with Bird Conservation Nepal. As you can see that a recent uh, publication has says that in Nepal we have 892 species of birds that is recorded. That is six new species have been recorded since 2018. And we have also been uh, keeping all the records and data of each and every birds and we have been publishing this, the Nepal's state, Nepal's birds, where, where we can find the scientific research of each and every birds. As I have said that 892 species of birds have been recorded. Uh, in, in that 892 species, all these species is not uh, found all over the seasons of Nepal. Some of them are the migratory species. Uh, some come from the winter, uh, some come as a winter migratory, some come as a summer migratory. Uh, and Along with that, we have 42, uh, uh, 42 species that is globally threatened, species that is found in Nepal. And, and in that 42 globally threatened species, uh, the, uh, the vultures are the ones. We have five species of vultures that is globally threatened uh, found in Nepal. As you can see here uh, in the red area, uh, the critical endangered, that is white term vulture, slender wheel vulture, Indian vulture, and red headed vulture are the critically endangered and the Egyptian vulture one is the endangered one. We have nine species of vultures that is found in subcontinent, Indian subcontinent, and all these nine species of vultures is found in Nepal. Next. As you can see that uh, vulture is, uh, vultures just uh, uh, do not kill anything. They just uh, eat the dead carcasses or divorce the dead carcasses and pro uh, helps us clean the environment. And not only the ecological role uh, that play with uh, cleaning the environment or uh, keeping the uh, environment free from other diseases, uh, culturally or religiously also vulture is very important. As you can see in Hindu mythology, uh, in the Ramayana uh, script holy book, is, is that the uh, goddess uh, Sita, uh, the uh, wife of Ram, was abducted by the uh, demon god uh, Ravan. And during that uh, process, uh, it, it, the uh, vulture named Jatayu, he helped uh, the Sita for this. And so, it, it, so this, the vulture got uh, killed during the processes. Also in the trans Himalay region or the Tibetan Buddhist uh, religion, uh, there is a, uh, there is a uh, they, they have a religion that the, if their uh, relatives gets, uh, 
uh, dead, then the, they give their dead bodies to the vultures and believe that the vulture uh, takes their uh, soul directly to the heaven. Ankit, if you talk about vultures or like the whole thing about vultures, I'll have nothing to ask. <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll, we'll stop the introduction here. Uh, we'll talk about vultures a lot more in this conversation. Uh, the, the title of this conversation is Paying Attention. And yeah, going into questions, I have a, like, while we were talking about the, this conversation, Isha, you mentioned about how, you know, a few anecdotes about how paying attention and looking at birds are like, it's, it's, a, it's a thing. Yeah, right? so um, I, I'm staying at Tajafa and uh, every morning I sit on the terrace and have my cup of coffee and uh, that's when I look around and look for the birds which are there. And yesterday, while it was raining, I was inside and I was talking to Shreya about birds and generally we were just talking and uh, she's like, what do you see here? There are only crows and pigeons, you know? And I'm like, can I tell you a secret? Today morning I saw nine species of birds right here. And so it's just that, uh, and she was surprised that, you know, like I don't see anything except crows and pigeons. And it's like, so that's what we were talking, that once you start paying attention to the environment around you, um, you tend to see and hear more and more, which makes you connected with nature wherever you are, whether it's in the middle of a very busy city or it's in the mountains or it's in the desert or life is everywhere and it's just about learning to pay attention to the life all around you, yeah. And I, Ankit, do you also have any anecdotes about paying attention? Because I have one, like, also, like you said, Isha, uh, during COVID I was going, I, uh, I, I started getting interested in birds during COVID and I went to my mamagar to meet my grandparents and then I was just looking out, there's just one tree, this is in New Road, like middle of the city. <laughs> like she said, there's nothing except for pigeons, not even crows, very little crows. So I also saw, started seeing these colorful birds and I also counted nine species and I was shocked. So do you also have more? Uh, Yeah, just, oh, uh, work still. No? No. <laughs> Can I shout? No. Nah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, just in the middle of the city also, uh, Durbar Mark, yeah. The fact that there are pigeons and crows and cattle eager that attracts peregrine falcons. They sit on the, fortunately, a lot of mobiles. Uh, towers are uh, uh, erected also in Kathmandu. Everything works finely together for the peregrine falcon. So when you sit there in a restaurant on a roof, look up and see whether a peregrine falcon is waiting for its chance to kill some of those birds. Uh, it can also work in a different way. It can also distract you. I always pay attention uh, also. I mean, I can't help that. Uh, like in the opening ceremony, when the vulture was shown, the spotted owlet was calling. I thought somehow that doesn't fit. But uh, that is one thing. But I, when I went back to Atsam a few years back, then uh, the, the, the government officer said, let's sit outside. And I was already a little bit apprehensive. I thought, nice, I, while the others talk, I can see because I had already seen some vultures going. And then uh, we were sitting on the shed with uh, corrugated iron. And then I saw a bird. I thought, that must be a golden eagle. So the guy was, uh, my, my, my colleague was talking. I thought, I can slip out for just a moment. Yeah, sorry, but this is very important. So I went out. And then when I came in, I was, of course, punished because I'm too tall for Nepal and I hit my head. And next to all the scars from all the other hits I have had in Nepal because I'm too tall, I have now one from the Acham, uh, from the Golden Eagle. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we actually do not, uh, we actually sitting in the core city do not pay attention to, to our surroundings, our neighborhood. Uh, actually, birds are really fascinating creatures. Uh, they have this unique behavior, unique uh, color, shape, size. Uh, so, so paying attention to the birds is not only 
looking at the birds, but uh, hearing them like their sounds or calls, and uh, uh, seeing them sitting around in which kind of trees, which kind of, uh, even they sit in our uh, terrace or they just build the nest in the uh, uh, holes of our bricks in the whole house. So looking at uh, that uh, thing uh, is uh, very essential, not only for uh, paying attention for yourself, but it's like allowing us to connect with the nature also. Yeah, and I would add to that that uh, it doesn't always have to be birds. I mean, uh, if you just pay attention to anything uh, around you, it will connect you to nature so much more, like the plants around you, the insects around you. Like today there was a honeybee and uh, it came to my plate and then it flew away. And uh, So it's, you are always surrounded by nature. It's just that you have to keep your eyes and ears open and feel connected by paying attention to that. Uh, yeah, it's uh, like you were saying earlier how you have to train your mind to pay to pay attention right nowadays we are like Ankit just said we're too distracted by our phone and we hardly even like we're just bowing down we're hardly look even looking straight you know? like why but okay my question is why should we look above the phone like why is it necessary to pay attention even? that's an interesting question I think uh, because we are not slaves of the phones I would answer that, that we belong to Earth and Earth is what it is giving us in return. We should at least respect that. And yeah. What, what happens when we pay attention, basically? Like, pay attention to birds, let's say. Why pay attention to birds? Makes you... Uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, are you asked? No, no, Mike. Oh, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> This is the working one. Um, well, if you pay attention, yeah, I've, I've not trained for it. It just has grown uh, and getting more and more interested. And then in the end, you, you can't help paying attention somehow. And that I know that, um, well, being in nature, I think for, for, for most people helps to give them a more peaceful feeling and, and uh, give them out. Okay, there's people who are addicted to their phone and even in nature would like it. Maybe we made the apps for them then. But uh, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it makes you happy. And, and uh, uh, like I, I was, the first my first experience when I was very young, I was 18 years, we went to hitchhiking through France and, and my friends, uh, they were not bird watchers and it was a silent road. There was no car at all. For hours we waited for the first car and he refused us. And all those times I had a time of my life. There were always birds around and I heard. And they were dead bored. So it, it has only advantages if you uh, learn a little bit about when you pay attention. Uh, you can also pay attention to plants, of course. Uh, that, that you start automatically as a birder. I think Isha mentioned already. Uh, birds, snakes, uh, butterflies, and everything, it comes... Uh, I, w I would still love to support the kind of flora for Nepal, just for common plants that people will get to know those. I don't know where... It, in, but in India and in Nepal, there are so many plants that uh, a field flora, which in the Netherlands would be like that, you can carry with you. It would be some work like this, and you're not going to carry it around. So maybe we have to make an app for that, too. Yeah. Uh, I've, well, I'll just connect this question. Like you said, you were 18 when you s got fascinated with birds. Right? I saw this meme once uh, because I follow a lot of bird uh, pages on Instagram now. Uh, it it was a conversation with two friends, and oh no, I forgot. Yeah, it it basically said if your friend knows names of birds, know that they're getting old. <laughs> but all three of you got interested in birds when you're quite young. <laughs> Six. So how, how, my question is, how did you get interested in birds and why? Okay, so I have a very interesting story to that. Uh, it started out of nowhere. I mean, 
I call it interesting because it's not at all interesting. But uh, uh, it started out of nowhere. I was working in my office, and uh, there was a small pond next to the terrace, and I saw a bird sitting there, which was, which did not fit into. I'm sorry, but uh, I'm, I've got some allergies, so sorry. But um, which did not fit into our general, my general at that time. Crows, pigeons, parrots, eagles, uh, spectrum, you know, it was a different looking bird and I could not fit it in either of these. And uh, so I took a photo of that bird, I sent it to my cousin and uh, he told me a long name, that black crowned night heron and I was like, wow, uh, that's a difficult one to remember. And um, uh, then I saw another bird. Then I saw 10 more, then I saw 100 more, and then I saw 1,000 more, and it just never ended. And so one after the other, it just kept on adding to that black crown night heron, which now, of course, I remember quite easily, but at that time, I, I literally had to mug up the name that this is the bird which I have seen, you know. But yeah, it, it can happen in an instant, and... Uh, there was this very famous uh, American bird watcher uh, lady uh, named uh, Phoebe Snetzinger, and uh, she named it as uh, the term as spark bird, that that one bird which creates that spark of birding in you and which will be there for the rest of your life and it won't leave you. So, yeah, that's the story. Yeah, I told you earlier that I was into the big mammals and I went to the jungle for the research for the big mammals. But uh, during that research, I first saw the green colored pigeon. <laughs> that was the spark one. But I actually clicked the photograph. I do not know, know the name of that bird. And I asked some of my colleagues who, uh, who was also uh, <coughs> By background, they are also the wildlife background, but they also do not know the birds. They are also into the mammals. Uh, so I just uh, uh, gave the photographs to other birders, and they just uh, gave, prove, prove me that it's actually the yellow-footed green pigeon. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was my, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I had maybe two. The first time, I used in a. Uh, I, I looked in a little uh, booklet about with, with 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 bird pictures and names. I did it with my brother. My brother looked at the chaffinch in the garden, and but he thought it looked more like a hawfinch, what we call in Europe. And for for two three years, I thought it was a hawfinch. So the first identification was wrong in my life and I don't know whether you can call that a spark bird uh, but then uh, one brother had this booklet and the other brother asked once to do the bin uh, uh, binoculars so um, then I saw a beautiful book advertised from Reader's Digest which is not always well, anyhow we are not talking about Reader's Digest but uh, the book was very beautiful had a big uh, Tony all on the front uh, beautiful pictures inside and I thought maybe I asked that for it was not my birthday but we have another present festival St. Nicholas it's called uh, it's around uh, end of November so I got it a little bit early and it had a little bit booklet with all with a lot of uh, same format as uh, as the the mobile and the chimichara booklet, uh, so that's where it comes from maybe. And I took it to the jungle with the durbin, and I identified the first time a long tilt tit. So that I can call my spark bird. And I was really wow, this bird I've never heard about. I've never seen. What is this? Yeah. So and, and, it's, and it's very clear. It's a long tilted. So that was my spark bird. That was in the nature area, ten minutes from my home. So I was also again lucky there. That ten minutes from my home, there was an area with a lot of birds. Long tilt was the first one. Yeah. Uh, you can find yellow-footed green pigeon in our exhibition in Chassel. <laughs> <laughs>
I'll be advertising that exhibition too much. <laughs> Just a <laughs> warning. Uh, one of the hundred Chimikichara. Yes, one of the hundred Chimikicharas. We'll come to Chimikichara as well. Before that, I want to ask uh, Ankit, from that spark bird, from yellow-footed green pigeon to vultures, how, how did that shift happen? What got you interested in vultures and why? Actually, uh, I have heard the vultures, but I have seen only one time in my life before joining the, this job as a vulture. I see the bird in Dang when I was doing my uh, carbon inventory. And I saw a bird. I, similarly, I clicked the photograph. I saw the huge bird. But after uh, putting that photographs to my birders and I see in the uh, Birds of Nepal book, it was a tiny vultures, that is Egyptian vulture. And I didn't know that there, are, there were nine vultures that is found in Nepal. Uh, but after joining the vulture conservation uh, in the vulture job, uh, the, after that only I found that uh, the nine vultures, <laughs> that is, uh, which I saw in the Jatai restaurant. Uh, you brought up Jatai restaurant. I think DBG is also here somewhere. Uh, DG, DBG also presented about uh, Jatai restaurant, and uh, we have an exhibition in Namkha uh, about Jatai restaurant. Can you talk a little bit about what Jatai restaurant is, what it does, why it was important? Actually, the vulture got declined in Nepal by about uh, 90%. Uh, it's uh, actually uh, the drug called diclofenac. It's a painkiller drug. Uh, which we use as anti-inflammatory anti drug for the cattle uh, to cure the cattle. And if the drug that is given to the cattle is dead and the dead cattle uh, is devoured by the uh, vulture, then the mass poisoning of the diclofenac can kill the vultures uh, with the kidney failure. So we had this 90% population down in Nepal, or even the 99.9% .9 in the subcontinent. Uh, so. Uh, so, uh, to give the safe food for the vultures, uh, the Jatai restaurant concept was uh, begun by uh, the local communities, and it is the first time the community-based, uh, community-led, this uh, Jatai restaurant, that is the vulture safe feeding site, was established in uh, uh, Noval Parasi, uh, Kaosuti. Uh, it is actually the community who uh, rears the old cows that is not used by the farmers. They bring the cows, they rear them, and after the natural death of the cow, it's given to the vultures. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's like a safe food for the vultures. And the Jatai restaurant, the community has uh, uh, not only conserved the vultures by giving the safe food, but they have preserved and uh, preserved the nesting colony around the areas. Uh, they have given the livelihood pro pro programs for the local communities. They have doing the sustainably uh, run uh, uh, the project uh, so that they can benefit the local communities as well. Again, a disclaimer, the Jatai restaurant is not a restaurant where you go eat <laughs> vultures. <laughs> it is a restaurant for vultures. Restaurant a lot of people have made that mistake. And DBG, the founder of uh, Vulture Restaurant, was telling us how people, because it's inside, like it's in a village, right? You have to travel a little bit. And people come there to actually find vultures, to eat vultures. <laughs> uh, coming to Aaron, they, they uh, talk a little bit about Chimiki Tsara campaign. Because, yeah, what is Chimiki Tsara campaign and why, why was it necessary to have that? Um, like, yeah. Mike, like. Oh. <laughs> Uh, we could also, well, anyhow. Um, yes, um, if you look at nature conservation and all those things, you, you see that people are not paying attention to birds, so they don't know how important they are, that they are part of our, the nature in which humans also play a role, often the role of a type of cancer for the society or for the, for the natural world, but still we play our role. And to understand that, you must start at the basics, I think. And the basics is also fun. So if you want to make people, to give people some pleasure and joy in a world which is not always like that, 
then why let them not look at the sky and in the trees and see birds and enjoy that? So it's sharing the pleasure we have as people who are really infected with the birding virus. But it's all, you have so many different birders. You have birders who do only 15 minutes per year or one hour per year. They go and then they think that's nice, that's okay. And then you have crazy people like me and people who are even more crazy. So Like me. <laughs> like you. Like you. And, uh, well, we still have to do a competition on that. But, <laughs> but uh, so it's a kind of sharing and also a basis for nature conservation. Because if people don't understand or don't value birds, then they also don't care about uh, nature conservation and bird conservation. So this app, we make it as low-key as possible. It's aimed at beginners. Um, and why we chose Chimigi Chara and not Jungle Chara is because beginners, but even so experienced people like me, might see more birds around the house than in the jungle. In the jungle, they hide inside the bushes. You must have good hearing and you must know the sounds, which, like Isha and me, we, we know some sounds now. But uh, it's still more difficult than, uh, than looking. But in the neighborhood, you know more, the, uh, the, the general public, uh, many of you, uh, we can count around it, fortunately, is that you know more birds, uh, you know, uh, you can see them more easily, and you can also do something for them. And when we talk jungle bird, the jungle is not yours, you don't know the sounds, uh, so that's why we focused on Chimikichara, and we reduced the 800 something birds of Nepal to 100 which we document. Although in the counting app you can also do add bird. It does not always work, but in the next version it will again. Uh, so that is, that is roughly uh, the difference we had in the beginning also. We had discussions with eBird, and at one moment we said maybe we don't need an app, we just need eBird. But then eBird and the Cornell University uh, they said, yeah, but anybody can submit lists from anywhere. So also from the jungle. And then they said, yeah, but then we go again into the jungle. And we should stay in the neighborhood of people so that people will be forced to look in their own area. And I imagine that uh, uh, people, families can look at those birds uh, together. Uh, I, I imagine also in parks and so grandfather takes his granddaughter there and they, they, they look at the birds there. Uh, that, that, that would be the ideal. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned eBird. The, uh, Isha, you're a member of eBird. And yeah. Can you explain what eBird <laughs> is and what it does? Yeah, so eBird is uh, a global citizen science app and uh, I'll explain in a short version of what eBird is that me sitting here in Nepal on the terrace of Tajafa, I just put in what I see around me and I submit that, which goes to a global server. And that data is, for example, um, if I give example of India because I'm more comfortable with Indian birds, um, let's say um, someone has reported bird A from uh, Himalayas, and then sometime uh, during October, the submit, the sighting of that bird stops from that area. And then suddenly you get reports of that bird A from South India. So you understand the migrating pattern that, okay, so uh, our bit is just to submit what we see around, and what eBird does is compile all the data to understand bird movements, bird behavior, bird migration, um, and uh, a lot of studies, uh, scientific studies of birds is uh, now being based on that data, which ev it's, that's why it's called citizen science, that every citizen of any country can submit that data to the science and it will be useful for science in future, yeah. So why did we need a different app when there's a global app? Why did we have to be different? Um, for the, so, so, 
one of the first instruments, one of the first instruments we use in the Chimikitsara domain is the uh, an annual or semi-annual neighborhood bird count, the Chimikitsara gonna. So uh, we want people to get also the national feeling of everybody counting together. That is also one of the principles of the garden bird counts in Europe, uh, that you have the feeling, oh, somebody in Humla or somebody in Taplazum is also counting at the same time. That gives a kind of feeling. For my, that was my idea. I thought that must also appeal to many people, especially nationalists or people who, who are proud of Nepal, uh, like me. Uh, so I thought that is one, uh, one way to do it. And it should go to a database that we can manage, just like with eBird. I'm also an eBird reviewer, so if anything goes with re uh, reviewing in uh, Nepal, uh, Krishna is also there. Maybe there are uh, some Yubin or others might also be there. Um, so if, if you submit in eBird, it goes to America and get mixed with jungle bird records. And I wanted only maps that show urban birds and these hundred birds and that they're uh, that we ask people to focus on their own neighborhoods and then we can tell more about it uh, and with eBird that was not possible so the first count we did in February on the same dates as the international backyard bird count which is organized uh, by Cornell University using eBird uh, but then and we thought we can upload our data uh, anonymously, uh, everything we get, because our app works not with uh, users, uh, user names and so, that we upload it in eBird. But then eBird said, no, that's not, you're not allowed to do that because uh, all kind of data protection and, and uh, uh, how do you say that, uh, privacy stuff. Uh, so we, can, we cannot do that. So then we said, okay, then this year we do it on a different date. Uh, in Feb mid February, we can still do the backyard bird count. Everybody was eBird. So does that? Yeah. Answer your question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, they were almost having a fight about eBird versus Chimikitsara when we were having a conversation. I hope after this we have some more time. <laughs> uh, Isha, can you talk a little bit more about Feather Library, what it is, and why it was necessary? Because you used to be a bird photographer. Yeah. Now you are photographing dead birds. Yeah. <laughs> which is very gross sometimes, but yeah. Um, so, um, during the lockdown, when um, birds were more friendly and there were no humans on the street, so uh, I've got four cats at home. And uh, uh, for birds' protection and for my cats' protection, I've got like four layers of bird net in each uh, balcony. Uh, one day there is a very small uh, bird, smaller than the sparrow, what you know about sparrow, but smaller than the sparrow, maybe this much of size. It got into the, those four layers of bird net. And my female cat, the instinct was to attack it. And luckily I was there, so I rescued it. I let it go. But birds tend to lose feathers in fright. So the where I held the silver bill and I let it go, it lost uh, three, four feathers. It, they were in my hand and the bird flew away. Uh, the largest feather of that bird was smaller than my little finger. And I knew about the large size feathers of Indian peafowl, which is peacock, which is like huge and vultures and eagles and and I thought to myself that where do I go and see the entire spectrum between this small feather in my hand and the largest feather which is there and I could not find the answer so I was like if there is no answer to it why don't I create one so that people in future will have something to look at. Um, and also very uh, common behavior which I have seen with children, with adults, no matter what age. And Arend is going to show me that. 
later on his collection but wherever you see a feather you would pick it up and you would wonder what species it belongs to that's like a very basic human tendency i've seen kids picking up feathers putting in their pockets and parents getting you know crazy about oh, what this dirty thing you are putting in your pockets and i've seen adults also do the same and uh, so where do you see that if you want a reference there was no reference for uh, feathers in particular which i said that which is very unique to birds and uh, so i thought uh, why don't i create a library where and which is open to public and we have museums like i had said that people used to shoot the birds and stuff them to in order to id them but the problem with them is uh, if i can be uh, if i show with my hands then the museums so the wings are always uh, tucked at the back yeah. in the museum specimens mm -hmm. and uh, once the specimens are dried they are stuffed and dried in 48 hours then you can't open the wings anymore it's always like that and the actual details of the wing feathers and the tail feathers is lost in all the museum specimens which we have across the globe so now uh, i went to cornell to learn this stuffing of the birds also but now what they've started is even in the modern museum they have one wing which is kept extended like that and the one wing which is uh, at the back like that so you have all the information but that's very recent and uh, and that's for usa that's not for india or any other our countries and we don't have any data like that we barely have museum specimens so and i uh, even if you have the specimens i think it's very difficult to get permission to go and see the collection and you have to apply and me being an architect no one would give me a permission to look at the bird collection mm -hmm. so um that's why i thought that i would keep it public that anyone who wishes to see the beauty <laughs> it's open for all all the scientific information is there so if anyone wants to do the research about uh, everything they don't have to apply for anything it's all there all you have to do is just go to the website and you'll get all the details of the bird of the feathers of the molting which is that small bird uh, small feather there that's a new feather which is emerging which is called molting in birds so that shows that that feather has been the old feather has been dropped off and a new feather is now uh, coming at the place of that old feather all these details can be known just by digitizing um specimens which otherwise are simply thrown away and uh, so rescue centers where birds die they are simply either buried or burned or thrown away and so my initiative was i went to the rescue centers i requested that the requested them that before you do that please let me um, digitize that get the data out of it and then you can do whatever you want if you wish to donate the feathers to the feather library it's you're most welcome if you want to throw it then also we at least have some archive in some form which is going to be preserved and uh, and that's how it started and uh, right now i think feather library has around 110 species of birds with multiple specimens not just one specimen with multiple specimens so you can compare between the specimens for example um, male has certain types of feathers or certain length of let's say parrot okay the common parakeet um, yeah here so next uh, there i can show yeah so this is the longest tail feather of a male parakeet and you can see that female have a little variation and all these things are still unanswered to the science so my idea is to create a data set for the future generation to ask such questions and to know more about birds to create inquisitiveness uh, about like getting even deeper than just taking photographs of the birds and uh, so going one step deeper into paying attention yeah that's the idea
Yeah, so uh, like you mentioned, it's about know, knowing more about birds, getting deeper into paying yeah. attention and uh, loving the birds a little bit more. Yeah. Right? And this all comes down to conservation. Yeah. You know? So uh, for all three of you in the things that you do, uh, you have been in some way or in some capacity working with the communities. Because most of the time, these big organizations that come with their projects, their agenda, and you know, force it on different parts of the globe, especially our part of the yeah, globe. Yeah. How important or like, like DBG has started conservation project from his village, from his own community. And it's effective. Like DBG keeps on repeating how if the community was not involved, this wouldn't have been possible. Right? So how much uh, do you think community plays? Uh, what kind of role does the community play in conservation in, through your own work? Should I go first? Yeah. Um, I think it's very important because um, so we have a tribal. Uh, I'm from Gujarat, India. And South Gujarat, there are, there are dense forests named Dangs. And uh, there are tribal people who are still living there. And when I was a photographer, I used to go there quite often, but I never talked, interacted with them. I never um, really conversed with them. And, you know, I mean, I was always an outsider. And I tried to... Uh, do my bit and go away. Um, so after I started Feather Library, um, I wanted, so the first time I went there after I started Feather Library, I was just talking to the local people there and telling them, showing them about these feathers. And um, the next day, this guy comes and so I was, as uh, he said that, you know, I was a part of them. I was not an outsider. I was a part of them. I sat with them. I ate with them. I tried to talk to them in their language, the, their dialect. And I told them about Feather Library and, you know, trying to make them aware because they live in the forest. And um, the next day, I, th this guy comes with two pockets full of feathers and just give that to me that this is for you. So I think when it comes to community, when you want to make them aware, you have to be a part of them. And uh, you can't preach them. You have to be friends with them and then just blend in. And, I, I'm, and they are equally eager to learn and understand and uh, appreciate the things which are around them. In fact, sometimes more than we are, uh, because they see it every day. They, they, it's their surroundings, right? So uh, and they have a very uh, strong attachment to their surrounding, especially the tribals who are living in the forest or who are very uh, not a part of a, uh, not very close to a city or, and they have, they're, they're, ve they're ve very, uh, sensitive about nature. And so if you just blend in, and if you just tell them, they will be, I mean, I, they are the best teachers, I, I would say that, because they have so much things to teach us rather than us telling them something to do. Uh, yeah, community-based uh, conservation, as you said. Uh, in Nepal, uh, the community forest concept uh, is based on co uh, based on this uh, community-based conservation, and it is one of the models for world uh, that the community forest uh, is based on the community uh, with the uh, on ground uh, and the house house to house uh, uh, benefits they give from the community forest. And as you said, that one of the leading example from the vulture is that the community-based uh, the Jatai restaurant uh, that is also really appreciated in the worldwide and they have been copied even to the Africa and India about the Jatai restaurant and that that is led by the community and uh, as I uh, want to mention that uh, 
if we have to go in the community uh, uh, for a long term and for the sustainable sustainable run for the conservation, we have to be in the community, and this would lead the project. Uh, not not just the, some NGO or INGO giving their scientific data. It's very hard uh, for them to preach them or aware them about the scientific term. Uh, but but going through the community, it's very easy and also the sustainable. I have three examples. Is that possible to share? First, I'll stop you when it's first, going on. Earlier, you asked about the difference between our app and eBird. That's exactly the reason is that this is an app for Nepal and an app for beginners. And eBird shows only names. We show an app with pictures and more easy to count. And the stories are Nepal-based, related to Nepal, and we are going to translate it. OK, eBird says we can also, in due time, also translate, like I think for Hindi and everything that works already, yeah. but for Nepali, not yet. But uh, so, and we combined, you have eBird app, which is for counting, and you have the Merlin app for identification. And we actually combined those two. So the eBird app, yesterday we talked it also in Niranzan's or Sri Zanalaya's program with the teachers. Uh, we like to, and actually uh, one, one of the ideas uh, was of my son, uh, uh, who is the app developer, is that we can put quizzes in to make it more interesting. Yeah, Ebert or Merlin will not do that. Yeah, they, they do it maybe on some website or in some course or so. But we in the Nepali app, we can add those. And then the second one is, what I like about Photo Kathmandu's initiative in uh, Patan is that you, if you work with communities, trust building is the first thing. You have already a relation with the community in Patan and for BCN, we would have to look for a place and then build relation. And sometimes that doesn't go good because BCN, like many NGOs and others, they work for a certain time according to whatever the donor allows them, uh, gives them money for. And then they go and then the community, if they're not able or not really owning the thing, they will not, uh, they, they, they will not continue with it. And as a Rural development specialist, I'm of course uh, very much exposed to that. In, in Bangladesh, we had a program, uh, a flood control project, where people could uh, propose structures and where the engineers could propose structures and things that were pushed through by the engineers, structures that were pushed through or, or were proposed by the engineers, discussed with the community, things that were proposed by the community say it has to be like that and things kind of uh, hybrids. The ones that scored of course the best were the ones that were proposed by the community. And the ones proposed by the engineers who said this is really important and uh, they, they uh, nobody cared about them so that didn't work. So things have to come from the community and in that sense I uh, for, for the uh, bird-friendly uh, garden that uh, that uh, will be supported by Photo Kathmandu and where uh, BCN and we will be happily advising. I think the main advice will be from local people and also, like yesterday, uh, talking about education. I would like to hear what the children say about it. When they go, they will come with crazy ideas that might be the best. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that exercise. That is a really nice segue um, to... Oh, I'll just right. add one more thing to this side, uh, came to my mind just now, uh, the community-based. Uh, so in, I'll, I'll just give an example uh, of, I think there is only one, as far as birds are concerned, that uh, in India we have a state called Arunachal Pradesh, and uh, there are many communities, there are I think 42 communities within that state. And uh, in 2006, a new bird was discovered in Arunachal Pradesh. And what they did was extremely amazing thing that where the bird was found, the land was owned by the Bugun community. And they simply named the bird Bugun Leo Sikla. And so now the entire Bugun community feels that that bird is our pride 
it's our job to protect that bird and it's it's a very rare bird i mean it's just a few pairs i mean it's not abandoned or anything and it's in, it's found only in that small pocket of arunachal pradesh and when they were naming the bird they just named it bugun leo sikla and suddenly this community wakes up and it's like okay it's our pride it's our bird you know and like a simple gesture from one side just if we can be you know that sensitive and it just gives the whole community based conservation a whole new dimension so yeah that DBG created. Uh, I think he went out, but... He's, he's right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Um, so I was working on the list he created with uh, Tharu names, Nepali names, and English names. And um, how Isha talked about, like, when birds are named certain things, certain things can be possible with, with the language that is used. And I just, I was working on it, and I was romanizing the Nepali names into English. And <laughs> I came across this name. Uh, this bird was named Lobi Papi Giddha, Gorud, sorry. And it means selfish, sinner, stork. So like, I just wanted to ask like, how those names also come into being, and how and serious and funny it sounds. You know, because some names contribute to a bird being accepted by a community, but then there are names like Lobi Papi, Garud. And I wanted to ask DVG to what the name means in Tharu. Is it similar? Because in English, it's perfectly fine. It's like woolly neck stork. Yeah. And in Tharu, it's, um, I forget. Could you tell us? And could you tell us the meaning? So, uh, Namaste, everyone. So, uh, all the Nepali names uh, were in the book, uh, which is created uh, Nepal, uh, like a uh, Nepal Kachara Haru. So, uh, it is not all uh, came from our national language, came from, you know, different uh, language and different dialects from different parts of Nepal. So, it is, I'm also very surprised to hear that name, you know, I don't know uh, from which part of Nepal. Lobi Papi Garud, you know. It's a very strange name, but uh, it is named, you know. Uh, but in our language, like uh, the bird uh, I know, and then in our, like, uh, Tharu language, uh, from where I started learning about, you know, like birds and other wildlife. So uh, mostly there is meaning, and uh, named after their behavior, their call, and their, like, uh, you know, uh, like uh, colors. Uh, and then shape and sizes. So lobi papi garud, uh, like uh, in Tharu, like uh, the, all the strokes are like uh, we do not call all strokes like garud and so on. So like uh, for example, lesser adjutant stroke. Sorry, just I'm telling you just to make it clarify. Like uh, a lesser adjutant is uh, garul. We do not call garud in a uh, garul. And then uh, SN open bill stroke is called. Kong uh, Fora because they break the snails, you know, they find the snails in the, even in the deep water. So there is a few names of that um, um, necked stork, like uh, sometimes people they call them, so because of the white neck. Uh, white neck, uh, like, a, and then they call it like a Gorti Ghentek Garulawa, sometime. They call it, and then also they call it, you know, like um, because mostly they live in pair. Like uh, people, they know by different names, you know, and sometimes they call it like uh, because they always live. Like mostly we can find them two. Uh, very rarely we see one. So uh, also they uh, they call like uh, in Tharu language, like Joliahi uh, Garulo uh, means like always they live. So two. And also, there is a different name by uh, like a Tharu language in different parts of uh, Nepal. Does it make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Do you do any of you have an answer to Lobi Papi Garud? <laughs> no, I've 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 no idea. But 
in the in the app's next version, which will be the the next next version, there will be at the description of each bird there will be local names also. That's the idea, original idea of Jaya Bandari, but actually. Salim Ali and Ripley's guide have that also at the beginning. Sometimes even the Nepali n name is mentioned. Uh, uh, it would be lovely to have all the local names of Nepal, although maybe the app has to um, will increase in uh, uh, double in size. <laughs> we have to see how we manage that. Krishnaji, do you have any answer to this question? <laughs> Krishna is a very uh, wise guy. He knows those things. I have not uh, actually the answer, but then uh, the name in the Nepal is co mostly collected from the Sanskrit, and some of, uh, some of them are adapted from the local language. And realizing that that things in the in the next steps, um, the bird's name is changes for the about these 15, 16 species, like the lobi papi garud is now the seto kante garud, like the uli neck strokes, and some is like the boxy chil or something like that. Uh, as you said that it may it may affect the, some of the negative impact to the community and in the listener at the board watcher so so and the people uh, uh, we are so realizing that and changes the name but uh, but uh, but the, we respect the some of the local concept and local names then i heard the one story about the louis papi garud and when the um, hemsagar bral and his team is visiting to the local community and they asked the name of that boss and some people recommend said that we we are saying that something like that uh, so uh, I think they they, uh, they value the um, local information and their persuasion. So they put the name like something like that. And uh, just saying about the lobi papi gurus, and then we have the more than six and seven name depending on the different communities. So sometimes the name also uh, seems to be funny and the negative impact. But we uh, we encourage the we, uh, information from the local people and we. We really appreciate and we are re uh, ready to change the name in, uh, in the forthcoming years. Thank you. Yeah, there was another question here. Yes, uh, can I uh, uh, answer this, uh, uh, Which I have heard and uh, uh, what I have heard and, you know, uh, the legend goes. Uh, Lobi Papi, uh, as you said, this, uh, what you call Uli Naik, when he try to eat, when, you try, when he's forging, when he find some uh, bongi or some insect, <coughs> You see that uh, other one nearby, it will immediately, yeah. <laughs> very greedily uh, swallows up. Number one, so that is uh, for being lobby. <laughs> Papi is because it's killing a live thing and eating live thing because <coughs> name has coming from Sanskrit. See Sanskrit those days, most of them uh, who translated and all were uh, vegetarian, uh, not to kill, <laughs> thing like that. So this is an ancient name called lobby Papi for that girl. Uh, now, okay, as a time change, uh, people might be offended by calling this kind of thing, so that's why uh, things are changing. Like uh, we call Patsi Unechara, where it's supposed to, is, is to be earlier Damai Chara. Hmm? Now it becomes Patsi Unechara. It's, it basically, it's a action of that bird, you know, it's a stitching a leaf, it's a common tailor bird. Yeah. We still call a tailor in English, yeah. right? It's a common tailor bird within, say, uh, leaf stitcher. So that's why it's, it's in my name should not exactly match with uh, English or which were of, uh, other, but wherever is a local name, local name should be also used. Uh, or, you know, lo local, I mean, when I say it's Nepali name, uh, different uh, dialects uh, speaking, they should have different name. Like example, everybody who ever goes and see this uh, great government, co uh, great government, they say immediately, say, oh, has, has, kalo has, machakane has. So, but I always say it's no. It's kawa, it's a crow. But then they get offended. Oh, no, how can it be? It's a jaleba. Yeah. Yeah. Jal kawa. See? Jal kawa. And in Newari, loko. <laughs> so there, there are already names in different uh, languages. And if, uh, if people want to know a little bit about more about Nepali names, there are only several birds' names written by Langsung Bangdel. There should be a called Nepal Kachara Haru. There should be a book which is uh, done in 2039. Uh, that book was published by uh, uh, Rashtra Pragya Pristan, I think. Yeah, I think the important part is that people should relate it to the bird, what they're talking about. The name itself doesn't matter. It's just that each community should 
relate to the by the means of the name because otherwise when we talk there are scientific names which we also don't know the meaning of but that's like globally um, uh, recognized right but that's not the point. The point is that the local community, the local people, so uh, for example in India, each state has a different language and each language has a different name for each bird, the same bird. So it's the same thing. That the, the idea is that to connect people with nature and not the, na the name, sometimes it just, it's just a means of connecting the people with nature. Yeah. That is also exactly a uh, few of the themes that we are tackling in Foro Kathmandu. Uh, we have DBG's work on uh, Tharu names, as you just said, you know, about how, and also in the same space in Kopinche, we have works by KTK Belt and Uriel Orlo about giving names, you know, like just what you're saying and the local names, how uh, names and knowledge have been colonized. In this case, Sanskrit has colonized the local names in Tharu, in different, there are so many different languages in Nepal, you know, but this one language, uh, Nepali or Sanskrit, it has colonized different, you know, different forms of knowledge, different knowledge in Nepal as well. And the, yeah, so, this is the, the conversation, and this is a very interesting conversation to have as well, right? And uh, that goes in the exhibition, like KTK Belt uh, talks about how this local knowledge, the, the, like you just mentioned, no? Uh, the, the farmers, yeah. so KTK Belt's work uh, is a video series on farmers talking about local plants and local names of plants and the uses of these plants, so which the, uh, which medical science may not have uh, answers to or may not have proven something, but they've been, this knowledge has been going on for many years. Right? So uh, the, the colonization of languages is also affecting now bird names and how we look at birds even. You know, so uh, maybe is it important to change names like Krishnaji just said? You know, maybe new names have to be formed, or maybe we can, we don't even have to name, give them new names because different communities have their own names. names yeah. you know? So there was uh, I, I think another if question. You, if you want to piss off all the birders, then give all the birds new names because everybody will be <laughs> extremely upset. It happens too often already. <laughs> so there was and, a question. And, uh, just a second, I'll just answer to you. Um, uh, if you want to know the origin of the Latin name, there is a very interesting book called uh, Latin Bird Names, Latin Names for Bird Lovers or something like that, which actually gives the meaning of why the scientific name has been given to the bird, the reason why all all these like woolly neck stock then why it's called woolly neck stock and there's a latin name for it in scientific community so it's i think it's latin for bird lovers or something like that so yeah yeah hello can you hear me yeah isha my question to you is uh, um, do you have a can you specify statistics how many um, feathers do you have of how many species and are you the only one doing it or do you have a team or are you also open for a collective for people to contribute, you know? Uh, okay, okay, three questions, one question at a time. Yes. <laughs> um, first is, um, e so f I'll answer your question first that uh, how many feathers do I have, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's not about the uh, quantification, but as this thing is open, um, each uh, wing and each tail has got, uh, for almost all birds, a fixed number of feathers. For example, in wing, um, can I have a... Yeah, hello, yeah. So, um, if you see this wing, uh, from here to here, this notch, they are called primary feathers. From here to here, they are called secondary feathers. And then you have tail feathers. So 
what you see in that uh, plate, which is gone. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so those are the primary feathers, which are generally 9 to 10. Uh, these are the secondary feathers, which can vary across the species uh, throughout the bird families. And these are the tail feathers, which are generally either 10. So it's a set. I mean, uh, so it's left and right. So it's either uh, 10 or 12. Now, how many feathers? So for example, this individual where I got, it has, if you notice, it has got this set missing. And so it's about uh, scientifically putting, um, so I would say that in this case, I've got uh, 10 and 111, but it should be ideally, it should be 12 because one feather had fallen or because it's, I al always collect the data from the rescue center so the bird might be injured or some feathers might be missing or but we try to um, uh, document as much as possible because this as I said that since the museum have this kind of things except Salim Ali no one knows how many primaries and how many secondaries and how many tail feathers a bird has that that data is also for especially for indian subcontinent that data is also lacking so uh, what we are right now as as i am working as we speak uh, sometimes i figure out okay oh my god i've just made uh, nine primaries in this and I, I ideally it should be 10 and then i rectify myself because ideally it's 10 but uh, to quantify your uh, question i have got around 280 individual birds already documented like this. So, and you can multiply how many ever feathers you are seeing here, more or less. Sometimes the secondaries go from six to in Greater Flamingo, there are 21 secondary feathers. So the primaries are 10, but the secondaries will go to 21 feathers because they are long flyers and depend on their flight ability, if they are short flyers, if they are long flyers. And that will keep on varying from families to families depending on the bird. Yeah. But yeah, there are 280 individual birds with... Spe species or birds? 110 species with 280 uh, specimens. Yeah. Uh, you can access that through featherlibrary.com. Yeah, it's a, the website is called featherlibrary.com. Yeah, it's pretty simple and open. So, yeah, your next question. Yeah, I, f I forgot your question. <laughs> yeah, so um, I have a team. Uh, I have, like, I'm the founder. I have a co-founder who works at the rescue center, who is the curator of the rescue center. Uh, I've got a photographer, of course. I've got some volunteers who are doing a tedious job like uh, measuring the feather length and putting those data in. And so I've, I've, I've got a team around 10 people back in Gujarat. Um, what I'm planning, I'm, I'm planning eventually to make this a collective effort like a citizen science effort that anyone can post a bird and maybe but i think it it's still quite new and i'm also learning because this is the first time some i mean i i don't have any reference to look at so every point i am also evolving but yeah in, in in some point i would like to make it a collaborative effort of uh, at present what i'm trying is i'm trying to uh, get permission from different states of India, because you have to get permiss per per permissions from uh, each forest department of different states in order to photograph the feathers of the dead bird. So, and that's really a uh, long-term project, so I'm right now focusing on that. But eventually, yes, I would like to uh, do that, hopefully someday, yeah. Uh, we have time for one last question or comments. Uh, uh, one more note, just before you clap, uh, you can <laughs> you can download the Chimiki Tsara app as well. Please download the Chimiki Tsara app. It's a very fascinating thing. And now you can clap. Thank you, Isha. <laughs> Thank you, Arundai. Thank you, Ankit, for all your insight. Thank you.